Chapter 2. Why It Matters. The Ambassador of Ecstasy. In 2011, an out-of-work television host named Jason Sylvie One posted a short, strange video on the internet, titled You Are a Receiver. To the video was a too-minute barrage of quick-cut sci-fi imagery interspersed with shots of Silva, wearing jeans and a t-shirt, talking directly to the camera. What he was talking about was existential philosophy, evolutionary cosmology, and altered states of consciousness, that is, topics that don't usually show up in viral videos. In 2011, the web's hottest fare were cartoon cats and honey badgers, but Silva's video struck a nerve, grabbing nearly half a million views in less than a month. More videos followed. Between 2011 and 2015, Silva put more than 100 different offerings online, garnering over 70 million views. NASA and Time reposted his work. The Atlantic ran a long profile, three anointing him the Timothy Leary of the viral video age. Then the National Geographic Channel hired him to host Brain Games, which became their highest-rated TV show ever and earned him an Emmy nomination. Yet, to Silva. All this attention came as something of a surprise. When I started making videos, the goal wasn't celebrity. It was sanity. Silva was born in Caracas, Venezuela, in 1982 and grew up during a turbulent time in the country's history, while raised in a middle-class family. His parents divorced when he was 12 and his father lost all his money when the Venezuelan economy collapsed in the late 1980s. There was an unsuccessful coup in 1992 and a successful coup in 2000. Crime and corruption skyrocketed. Every member of my family was held up at gunpoint. Recalls Silva, my mother, my brother, even my grandmother. My father was kidnapped. I was a target. It was terrifying. It colored everything. My mom's not home by 5 p.m. So did she get kidnapped? Did she get killed? It was this constant. Knowing fear that never went away. That fear turned Silva into a shut-in. By the time he was a teenager he could barely leave his house. He became paranoid. Constantly wondering if all the doors were locked, if the noise he just heard was an intruder. I was a kid. He says, it was supposed to be this carefree time. But I was always battling crazy. Neurotic thoughts and it was just crippling. In high school. In an effort to recover sanity and a social life, Silva started organizing little gatherings at his house. I was inspired by Baudelaire's hashish salons. He says, so every Friday night a bunch of us would get together. Some people drank wine. Some people smoked pot, but everyone talked philosophy. And those conversations would swallow me whole. I'd go off on a monologue and disappear. Totally out of my head. And it was exactly what I was searching for. A way to shut off my neurotic brain. Quickly. Silva found these Friday nights shaping the rest of his week, as if those altered hours were overriding those fearful years. He discovered a new sense of confidence. I was always looking for my niche. I wasn't a great athlete, or the best student, or one of the cool kids. But those states showed me a part of myself I never knew existed. It started to feel like I had a superpower. That's where the videos came in. At first, to ensure he wasn't just babbling. Silva had his friends record him during his rants. Later, he watched the tapes. I was stunned. The stuff coming out of my mouth. Jaw-dropping connections between ideas. I had no idea where the insights were coming from. It was me. But it wasn't me, and those videos led to film school in Miami. Where he made even more videos. These efforts soon garnered attention. Because they saw his work and liked his screen presence. Former Vice President Al Gore's network, for Current TV, hired him as a host. But it was a job he couldn't keep. Current was great. He explains, but most of what I did was read pop culture stories from a teleprompter. I didn't get to go off on crazy soliloquies. Which meant, I was cut off from flow. All that neurosis came flooding back. What I realized at current was that I couldn't live without frequent access to these states. So I quit. And started making videos about them. And Silva. Ecstasis had found an ambassador. Because the conditions of his life. And the wiring of his mind made his interior reality so uncomfortable, he got very good at tinkering with his consciousness. In his intuitive pursuit of these moments, Silva cobbled together a remarkably effective way to get outside himself for relief and inspiration. In high school, these states gave him back his life, in adulthood they gave him a career. Really? He says, what I found in altered states was freedom. First they gave me freedom from myself. Then they gave me freedom to express myself, then they showed me what was actually possible. But it's not just me, I think almost every successful person I've met, one way or another, has found a way to use these states to propel them to levels they didn't know were possible. And in saying one way or another, Silva's getting at an important point. While the ways people get into these states vary considerably, 
Their lived experiences share remarkable overlap. In fact, a big part of Silva's appeal hinges on this overlap. A Buddhist monk experiencing Satori while meditating in a cave, or a nuclear physicist having a breakthrough insight in the lab, or a fire spinner at Burning Man. He says, look like different experiences from the outside, but they feel similar from the inside. It's a shared commonality. A bond linking all of us together. The ecstatic is a language without words that we all speak. So, in the same way that the biological mechanisms underpinning certain non-ordinary states are remarkably consistent, our experiences of these states are, too. To be sure, the actual content will vary wildly across cultures. A Silicon Valley computer coder may experience a midnight epiphany as being in the zone and see streaming zeros and ones like the code from the Matrix. A French peasant girl might experience divine inspiration and hear the voice of an angel. An Indian farmer might see a vision of Ganesh in a rice paddy. But once we get past the narrative wrapping paper, what researchers call the phenomenological reporting, we find for signature characteristics underneath, selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness, or STE are for short. Certainly. Researchers have come up with plenty of other descriptions of altered states, but we chose the four categories of STE are for a specific reason 5 in reviewing the literature, we discovered that almost every previous breakdown of these experiences was weighed down by content. Trying to tease apart the consciousness-altering effects of meditation. For example, means wading through religious interpretations of what those states mean. Examine the academic criteria for flow. And you'll find empirical triggers for how to produce the state mixed in with the subjective experiences of the state. The same goes for many of the psychedelic rating scales, which often presuppose that future subjects will have a similar range of experiences as the original experimenters. But the four categories we've zeroed in on are content neutral. They're a strictly phenomenological description rooted in shared neurobiology. This gets us past initial preconceptions about what these experiences are supposed to mean or reveal, while there's still much work to be done. We've now introduced this model to researchers from Harvard, Stanford, Yale, and Oxford, and they've found it useful. It's experimental and experiential and we hope it can help simplify and integrate the ongoing conversation around altered states. Selflessness. Despite all the recent talk about supercomputers and artificial intelligence, the human brain remains the most complex machine on the planet. At the center of this complexity lies the prefrontal cortex, our most sophisticated piece of neuronal hardware. With this relatively recent evolutionary adaptation came a heightened degree of self-awareness, an ability to delay gratification, plan for the long term, reason through complex logic, and think about our thinking. This hopped-up cogitation promoted us from slow, weak, hairless apes into tool-wielding apex predators, turning a life that was once nasty, brutish, and short into something decidedly more civilized. But all of this ingenuity came at a cost. No one built an off switch for the potent self-awareness that made it all possible. He self is not an unmitigated blessing. Six writes Duke University psychologist Mark Leary in his aptly titled book, The Curse of the Self. It is single-handedly responsible for many, if not most of the problems that human beings face as individuals and as a species, conjures up a great deal of personal suffering in the form of depression, anxiety, anger, jealousy, and other negative emotions. When you think about the billion-dollar industries that underpin the altered state's economy, isn't this what they're built for? To shut off the self. To give us a few moments of relief from the voice in our heads. So, when we do experience a non-ordinary state that gives us access to something more, we feel it first as something less and that something missing is us. Or, more specifically, the inner critic we all come with, our inner Woody Allen, that nagging, defeatist, always on voice in our heads, you're too fat, too skinny, too smart to be working this job too scared to do anything about it. A relentless drumbeat that rings in our ears. This was Silva's monologue too. But he stumbled onto a curious fact, altered states can silence the knack. They act as an off switch. In these states, we're no longer trapped by our neurotic selves because the prefrontal cortex, the very part of the brain generating that self, is no longer open for business. Scientists call this shutdown seven transient hypofrontality. Transient means temporary. Hypo? The opposite of hyper means less than normal. And frontality refers to the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that generates our sense of self during transient hypofrontality. Because large swatches of the prefrontal cortex turn off, that inner critic comes offline. Woody goes quiet. Without all the badgering, we get a real sense of peace. This peacefulness may result from the fact. Continues Leary that without self-talk to stir up negative emotions, the mystical experience is free of tension. And with tension out of the way, we often discover a better version of ourselves, more confident and clear. 
For me, explains Silva. It's a simple equation. If I hadn't learned to shut off the self, I'd be the same mess I was back in Venezuela, too fearful to do much of anything. But once the voice in my head disappears, I get out of my own way, and the benefits of selflessness go beyond silencing our inner critic. When free from the confines of our normal identity, we are able to look at life and the often repetitive stories we tell about it with fresh eyes. Come Monday morning, we may still clamber back into the monkey suits of our everyday roles. Parent, spouse, employee, boss, neighbor, but by then we know they're just costumes with zippers. Psychologist Robert Keegan, a chair of adult development at Harvard, has a term for unzipping those costumes. He calls it the subject-object shift and argues that it's the single most important move we can make to accelerate personal growth. For Keegan, our subjective selves are, quite simply, who we think we are. On the other hand, the objects are things we can look at, name, and talk about with some degree of objective distance. And when we can move from being subject to our identity to having some objective distance from it, we gain flexibility in how we respond to life and its challenges. In time, Silva noticed exactly this change. Whenever I get out of my head, I get a little more perspective. And every time I return, my world is a little bit wider and I'm a little bit less neurotic. Over the years, it's made a real difference. That's Keegan's point. When we are reliably able to make the subject-object shift, as he points out in his book In Over Our Heads, you start constructing a world that is much more friendly to contradiction, to oppositeness. You being able to hold on to multiple systems of thinking. This means that the self is more about movement through different forms of consciousness than about defending and identifying with any one form. By stepping outside ourselves, we gain perspective. We become objectively aware of our costumes rather than subjectively fused with them. We realize we can take them off. Discard those that are worn out or no longer fit, and even create new ones. That's the paradox of selflessness. By periodically losing our minds we stand a better chance of finding ourselves. Timelessness. A quick search on Google yields over 11.5 billion hits for the word time. In comparison, more obvious topics of interest like sex and money rank a paltry to 0.75 billion and to billion, respectively. Time and how to make the most of it. Appears to be about five times more important to us than making love or money. And there's good reason for this obsession. According to a 2015 Gallup survey, 948% of working adults feel rushed for time and 50% report significant stress as a result. Bosses, colleagues, kids, and spouses all expect instant response to emails and texts. We never really get free of our digital leashes. Even in bed or on vacation, Americans are now working longer hours with less vacations than any industrialized country in the world. Time poverty. 10 as this shortage is known, comes with consequences. When are juggling time? Harvard economist Sentil Mullenathan recently told the New York Times, you borrow from tomorrow. And tomorrow you have less time than you have today. It's a very costly loan. Non-ordinary states provide some relief from this rising debt. And they do it in much the same way as they quiet our inner critic. Our sense of time isn't localized 11 in the brain. It's not like vision which is the sole responsibility of the occipital lobes. Instead, time is a distributed perception, calculated all over the brain, calculated, more specifically, all over the prefrontal cortex, during transient hypofrontality. When the prefrontal cortex goes offline, we can no longer perform this calculation. Without the ability to separate past from present from future, we're plunged into an elongated present, what researchers describe as the deep now. Energy normally used for temporal processing gets reallocated for focus and attention. We take in more data per second and process it more quickly when we're processing more information faster. The moment seems to last longer, which explains why the now often elongates in altered states. When our attention is focused on the present, we stop scanning yesterday for painful experiences we want to avoid repeating. We quit daydreaming about a tomorrow that's better than today with our prefrontal cortex offline. We can't run those scenarios. We lose access to the most complex and neurotic part of our brains. And the most primitive and reactive part of our brains, the amygdala, the seat of that fight or flight response, calms down, too. In his book The Time Paradox, 12 Stanford psychologist Philip Zimbardo, one of the pioneers in the field of time perception, describes it this way, when you are fully aware of your surroundings and of yourself in the present, increases the time that you swim with your head above water, when you can see both potential dangers and pleasures, you are aware of your position and your destination. You can make corrections to your path. In a recent study published in Psychological Science, 
13 Zimbardo Stanford colleagues Jennifer Ocker and Melanie Rudd found that an experience of timelessness is so powerful it shapes behavior. In a series of experiments, subjects who tasted even a brief moment of timelessness felt they had more time available, were less impatient, more willing to volunteer to help others, more strongly preferred experiences over material products, and experienced a greater boost in life satisfaction. And when we do slow life down, we find the present is the only place in the timescape we get reliable data anyway. Our memories of the past are unstable and constantly subject to revision. Like a picture book honeymoon overwritten by a bitter divorce, memory distortions are basic 14 and widespread in humans. Acknowledges cognitive psychologist Elizabeth Loftus, and it may be unlikely that anyone is immune. The past is less an archived library of what really happened, and more a fluid director's commentary we're constantly updating. Future forecasts aren't much better. When we try to predict what's around the bend, we rarely get it right. We tend to assume the near future will look much like the recent past. That's why events like the toppling of the Berlin Wall and the 2008 financial collapse caught so many analysts flat-footed. What looks inevitable in hindsight is often invisible with foresight. But when non-ordinary states trigger timelessness, they deliver us to the perpetual present, where we have undistracted access to the most reliable data. We find ourselves at full strength. That was another thing I noticed. Says Silva, when I go off on a tangent and the ideas start to flow, there's no room for anything else. Definitely not for time. People who see my videos often ask how I can find all those connections between ideas. But the reason I can find them is simple. Without time in the picture, I have all the time I need. Effortlessness. These days, we're drowning in information. But starving for motivation. Despite a chirpy self-improvement market peppering us with endless tips and tricks on how to live better, healthier, wealthier lives, we're struggling to put these techniques into action. One in three Americans. For example, is obese 15 or morbidly obese even though we have access to better nutrition at lower cost than at any time in history? 8 out of 10 of us are disengaged or actively disengaged at work. Despite the HR circus of incentive plans, team building offsites, and casual Fridays, big box health clubs oversell memberships by 400% 16 in the certain knowledge that, other than the first two weeks in January and a brief blip before spring break, fewer than 1 in 10 members will ever show up. And when a Harvard Medical School study confronted patients 17 with lifestyle-related diseases that would kill them if they didn't alter their behavior, 87% couldn't avoid this sentence. Turns out, we'd rather die than change. But just as the selflessness of an altered state can quiet our inner critic, and the timelessness lets us pause our hectic lives, a sense of effortlessness can propel us past the limits of our normal motivation. And we're beginning to understand where this added drive comes from. And flow. As in most of the states 18 were examining, six powerful neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, dopamine, endorphins, serotonin, anandamide, and oxytocin, come online in varying sequences and concentrations. They are all pleasure chemicals. In fact, the, the six most pleasurable chemicals the brain can produce in these states are one of the only times we get access to many of them at once. That's the biological underpinning of effortlessness. I did it, it felt awesome, I'd like to do it again as soon as possible. When psychologist Mithili Sikshant Mahali did his initial research into flow, his subjects frequently called the state addictive and admitted to going to exceptional lengths to get another fix The lifts the course of life to another level. 19 he writes in his book Flow, alienation gives way to involvement. Enjoyment replaces boredom, helplessness turns into a feeling of control. When experience is intrinsically rewarding life, is justified. So, unlike the slog of our to-do lists, once an experience starts producing these neurochemicals, we don't need a calendar reminder or an accountability coach to make sure we keep doing it. The intrinsically rewarding nature of the experience compels us. So many people find this so great and high 20 in experience. Wrote psychologist Abraham Maslow in his book Religion, Values, and Peak Experiences that it justifies not only itself, but living itself. This explains why Silva couldn't live without access to these states and left a great job at Current TV for the uncertain prospect of making more videos. It's why action and adventure athletes routinely risk life and limb for their sports and why spiritual ascetics willingly trade creature comforts for a chance to glimpse God. In a culture supposedly ruled by the pursuit 21 of money, power, prestige, and pleasure, Sikshant Mahali wrote in Beyond Boredom and Anxiety, it is surprising to find certain people who sacrifice all those goals for no apparent reason, by finding out why they are willing to give up material rewards for the elusive experience of performing enjoyable acts we learn something that will allow us to make everyday life more meaningful. But you don't have to take extreme risk or give up material reward to experience this benefit. It shows up wherever people are deeply committed to a compelling goal. 
when John Hagel, 20 to the co-founder of Deloitte Consulting Center for the Edge, made a global study of the world's most innovative, high-performing business teams, meaning the most motivated teams on the planet. He'd have found that the individuals and organizations who went the farthest the fastest were always the ones tapping into passion and finding flow. This ability to unlock motivation has widespread implications, across the board. From education to healthcare to business, motivational gaps cost us trillions of dollars a year. We know better. We just can't seem to do better, but we can do better. Effortlessness appends the suffer now. Redemption later of the Protestant work ethic and replaces it with a far more powerful and enjoyable drive. Richness. The final characteristic of ecstasy is richness. A reference to the vivid, detailed, and revealing nature of non-ordinary states. In his first video, You Are a Receiver, 23 Silva explains it like this, it's creative inspiration or divine madness. Or that kind of connection to something larger than ourselves that makes us feel like we understand the intelligence that runs throughout the universe. The Greeks called that sudden understanding an amnesis. Literally. The forgetting of the forgetting. A powerful sense of remembering. 19th century psychologist William James experienced this during his Harvard experiments 24 with nitrous oxide and mescaline, noting it's the extremely frequent phenomenon, sudden feeling, which sometimes sweeps over us. Having been here before as if at some indefinite pastime, in just this place, we were already saying just these things. And that feeling of waking up to some ineffable truth that's been in us all along can feel deeply significant, in non-ordinary states. The information we receive can be so novel and intense that it feels like it's coming from a source outside ourselves. But, by breaking down what's going on in the brain, we start to see that what feels supernatural might just be supernatural, beyond our normal experience, for sure, but not beyond our actual capabilities. Often, an ecstatic experience 25 begins when the brain releases norepinephrine and dopamine into our system. These neurochemicals raise heart rates. 26 tighten focus and help us sit up and pay attention. We notice more of what's going on around us. So information normally tuned out or ignored becomes more readily available. And besides simply increasing focus, these chemicals amp up the brain's pattern recognition abilities, 27 helping us find new links between all this incoming information. As these changes are taking place, our brain waves slow from agitated beta to calmer alpha, 28 shifting us into daydreaming mode, relaxed, alert, and able to flip from idea to idea without as much internal resistance. Then parts of the prefrontal cortex begin shutting down 29 we experience the selflessness, timelessness, and effortlessness of transient hypofrontality. This quiets the already know that. Move along voice of our inner critic and dampens the distractions of the past and future. All these changes knock out filters we normally apply to incoming data, giving us access to a fresh perspectives and more potential combinations of ideas. As we move even deeper into ecstasy, the brain can release endorphins and anandamide 30 they both decrease pain, removing the diversion of physical distress from the equation, letting us pay even more attention to what's going on. Anandamide also plays another important role here. 31. Boosting lateral thinking, which is our ability to make far-flung connections between disparate ideas, post-its, slinkies, silly putty, super glue, and a host of other breakthroughs all came when an inventor made a sideways leap, applying an overlook tool in a novel way. In part, that's anandamide at work. And if we go really deep, our brainwaves shift once again, pushing us toward quasi-hypnotic theta, a wave we normally produce only during REM sleep that enhances both relaxation and intuition. To wrap it all up, we can experience an afterglow of serotonin and oxytocin, 30 to prompting feelings of peace, well-being, trust, and sociability as we start to integrate the information that has just been revealed. And revealed is the right word. Conscious processing can only handle about 12,033 bits of information at once. This isn't much. Listening to another person speak can take almost 60 bits. If two people are talking, that's it. We've maxed out our bandwidth. But if we remember that our unconscious processing can handle billions of bits at once, we don't need to search outside ourselves to find a credible source for all that miraculous insight. We have terabytes of information available to us. We just can't tap into it in our normal state. A mold is the technical term 30 for for the sliver of the data stream that we normally apprehend. It's the reality our senses can perceive. And all umwalts are not the same. Dogs hear whistles we cannot. Sharks detect electromagnetic pulses, BC ultraviolet light, while we remain oblivious. It's the same physical world. Same bits and bytes, just different perception and processing. 
But the cascade of neurobiological change that occurs in a non-ordinary state lets us perceive and process more of what's going on around us and with greater accuracy. In these states, we get upstream of our umwalt. We get access to increased data, heightened perception, and amplified connection. And this lets us see ecstasy for what it actually is. And information technology, big data for our minds, wicked solutions to wicked problems. Now that we've mapped out the biology, and phenomenology beneath STER, we're going to turn our attention to a different couple of questions. While these states may make us feel better, can they help us think better? Do these short-term peaks enable us to solve real-world problems? In 2013, we were invited to participate in the Red Bull Hacking Creativity Project, 35 a joint effort involving scientists at the MIT Media Lab, a group of TED Fellows, and the namesake energy drink company, conceived by Dr. Andy Walsh. Red Bull's director of high performance, the project was the largest meta-analysis of creativity research ever conducted, reviewing more than 30,000 research papers and interviewing hundreds of other subject matter experts. From break dancers and circus performers to poets and rock stars, it was an impossible goal. Walsh explained, but I figured if we could crack something as hard to pin down as creativity, we could figure out almost anything after that. As of late 2016, with the initial phases of the research completed, the study came to two overarching conclusions. First, creativity is essential for solving complex problems, the kinds we often face in a fast-paced world. Second, we have very little success training people to be more creative, and there's a pretty simple explanation for this failure. We're trying to train a skill, but what we really need to be training is a state of mind. Conventional logic works really well for solving discrete problems with definite answers. But the wicked problems of today 36 require more creative responses. These challenges defy singular stable solutions. Issues as serious as war or poverty, or as banal as traffic and trends. Throw money, people, or time at any of these and you may fix a symptom, but you create additional problems. Financial aid to the developing world, for example, often breeds corruption in addition to its intended relief. Adding more lanes to the highway encourages more drivers and more gridlock. Fighting wars to make the world safer can make it more dangerous than ever. Solving wicked problems requires more than a direct assault on obvious symptoms. Roger Martin of the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management conducted a lengthy study of exceptional leaders stretching from Procter & Gamble's then COAG Laffley to choreographer Martha Graham and discovered that their ability to find solutions required holding conflicting perspectives and using that friction to synthesize a new idea. The ability to face constructively the tension 37 of opposing ideas. Martin writes in his book The Opposable Mind. Is the only way to address this kind of complexity. But developing Martin's opposable mind isn't easy. You have to give up exclusively identifying with your own. Singular point of view. If you want to train this kind of creativity in problem solving. What the research shows is that the either or logic of normal consciousness is simply the wrong tool for the job. Scientists have discovered a better tool. The amplified information processing and perspective that non-ordinary states provide can help solve these types of complex problems. And they can often do so faster than more conventional approaches. Take meditation. Research done on Tibetan Buddhists 38 in the 1990s showed that long-time contemplative practice can produce brainwaves in the gamma range. Gamma waves are unusual. They arise primarily during binding. 39 when novel ideas come together for the first time and carve new neural pathways. We experience binding as a ha insight. That eureka moment, the telltale signature of sudden inspiration. This meant that meditation could amplify complex problem solving. But, since the monks needed to put in more than 34,000 hours to develop this skill, it was a finding with limited application. So researchers began to consider the impact of short-term meditation on mental performance. Was it possible? They wondered, to cut some monastic corners and still get similar results. Turns out, you can cut quite a few corners. Initial studies showed eight weeks of meditation 40 training measurably sharpened focus and cognition. Later ones whittled that down to five weeks. Then, in 2009, psychologists at the University of North Carolina found that even for days of meditation produced significant improvement in attention, memory, vigilance, creativity, and cognitive flexibility, simply stated. Lead researcher Fadil Zaidan explained 41 to Science Daily, the profound improvements we found after just for days of meditation training are really surprising, comparable to results that have been documented after far more extensive training. Rather than pulling a caffeinated all-nighter to force a eureka insight or devoting decades to becoming a monk, we now know that even a few days training in mindfulness can up the odds of a breakthrough considerably. In the field of flow research, we see the same thing, being in the zone significantly boosts creativity. 
in a recent University of Sydney study. 42 researchers relied on transcranial magnetic stimulation to induce flow, using a weak magnetic pulse to knock out the prefrontal cortex and create a 20 to 40 minute flow state. Subjects were then given a classic test of creative problem solving. The nine dot problem. Connect nine dots with four lines without lifting pencil from paper in 10 minutes, under normal circumstances. Fewer than 5% of the population pulls it off, in the control group. No one did, in the flow-induced group. 40% connected the dots in record time, or eight times better than the norm. And this isn't a one-off finding. When Narasianis at DARPA and Advanced Brain Monitoring 43 used a different technique, neurofeedback, to prompt flow, they found that soldiers solved complex problems and mastered new skills up to 490% faster than normal. It's for this reason that, when the global consultancy McKinsey did a 10-year global study of companies, they found that top executives, meaning those most called upon to solve strategically significant wicked problems, reported being up to 500% more productive in flow. Similar results have also been showing up in psychedelic research. Several decades ago, James Fadiman, 40 for a researcher at the International Foundation for Advanced Study in Menlo Park, California, helped bring together 27 test subjects, mainly engineers, architects, and mathematicians drawn from places like Stanford and Hewlett Packard, for one specific reason. For months prior, each of them had been struggling to solve a highly technical problem. Test subjects were divided into groups of four, with each group receiving two treatment sessions. Some were given 50 micrograms of LSD. Others took 100 milligrams of mescaline. Both are microdosages, well below the level needed to produce psychedelic effects. Then subjects took tests designed to measure nine categories of cognitive performance enhancement and spent for hours working on their problems, while everyone experienced a boost in creativity. Some as much as 200%. What got the most attention were the real-world breakthroughs that emerged, design of a linear electron accelerator beam steering device, a mathematical theorem regarding nor gate circuits, a new design for a vibratory microtome, a space probe designed to measure solar properties, and a new conceptual model of a photon. None of these practical. Technical achievements are the kind of result that most people associate with the navel-gazing world of psychedelics. But, similar outcomes are happening in Fadiman's current survey of microdosing among professionals, with more than 400 responses from people in dozens of fields. The majority, as Fadiman recently explained, report enhanced pattern recognition can see more of the pieces at once of a problem they are trying to solve. With these developments, psychedelics have begun moving from recreational diversion to performance-enhancing supplement. A shift began about four or five years ago. Author and venture capitalist Tim Ferriss's 45 told us, once Steve Jobs and other successful people began recommending the use of psychedelics for enhancing creativity and problem-solving, the public became a little more open to the possibility, and as Ferris has explained on CNN, 46 it wasn't just the co-founder of Apple who made the leap. The billionaires I know, almost without exception, use hallucinogens on a regular basis. These are people who are trying to be very disruptive. They look at problems in the world, and they try to ask entirely new questions. Wicked problems are those without easy answers. Where our rational, binary logic breaks down and our normal tools fail us, but the information richness of a non-ordinary state affords us perspective and allows us to make connections where none may have existed before. And it doesn't seem to matter which technique we deploy. Mindfulness training, technological stimulation or pharmacological priming, the end results are substantial. Consider the gains. A 200% boost in creativity, a 490% boost in learning, a 500% boost in productivity 47. Creativity. Learning and productivity are essential skills and those percentage gains are big numbers. If they were merely the result of a few studies done by a couple of labs, they would be easier to dismiss. But there is now seven decades of research, conducted by hundreds of scientists on thousands of participants, showing that when it comes to complex problem solving, ecstasy could be the wicked solution we've been looking for.